right, welcome back to Physics 272. By the way, if you have a peanut allergy, just let me know after class. There will be no peanuts in class today. Just an advisory that there could be some next week. All right, chapter 19 is where we currently are in electric circuits. And some of the key ideas in chapter 19 that we've been discussing are as follows. Uh, we've talked about how to analyze circuits. Last time we went over the current node rule, which is basically what comes in must come out. Today we'll go over the voltage loop rule. We've also been talking about surface charges and how surface charges are the actual microscopic thing that makes the electric field that drives the current in a circuit. Uh, we'll see today that transient effects precede the steady state. So la last time, all in all last time, we talked about electron spin and we talked about how it is that electron spin uh, plays into a permanent magnet. We discussed equilibrium versus steady state in a current, in a circuit. So equilibrium and steady state, a uh, steady state means constant current. That's what steady state means. Steady state, constant current. Equilibrium is when that constant current equals zero. Okay? So equilibrium is a special case of steady state. Steady state is constant current. Equilibrium is constant current that equals zero. Now, we talked also about what's used up in a circuit. We saw that it's not that the little circuit elements are eating electrons, much, 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 no, no, no. Uh, we saw that what's getting used up is energy. So energy is being converted from chemical energy of a battery into heat or light or whatever it is that you're using to, to drive, your, that, that's the output of your circuit. We discussed currents, Kirchhoff's current node law. That's a lot of syllables, let's just say it again. Kirchhoff's current node law, there I did it flawlessly that time. And this is a long way of saying that what goes in must come out. So if current comes into a, a junction and then the paths split, right? What goes in must come out. So if it comes in, it has to come out. It's just that simple and this is a long way of saying that. We also looked at the electric field inside of a wire and we saw this about it. We saw, look, if we have a steady state situation, steady state means constant current, if I have a steady state situation in a wire, then all along that wire, what goes in must come out. So the current here equals the current here equals the current here and so on. And we saw that, well, in order to drive that, <coughs> microscopically thinking, if we think about ourselves as an electron, so imagine that you're an electron inside of that solid and you're part of this constant current, what's causing you to move? It would have to be a net electric field applied. Because as we saw, when an electron is in a solid, right, so pretend you guys in your chairs are the atoms inside of the, the metal and I'm an electron, I'm gonna run along the desks at a particular rhythm. That's how an electron knows how to sneak through a, a material is it just hits the right rhythm and bum 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 jogs along. Or if I go in this direction, it's a slightly different rhythm that I'd need to, to hop along the desks. And so what happened we saw was that there's thermal energy inside the material and so it's not like right now where the desks are sitting still. If we were in a real material and your desks were the atoms and I'm an electron trying to run through, it's like all the desks are wiggling a little bit. Wiggle, 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 okay? And as we turn up the temperature to room temperature, it's wiggling, wiggling a lot. And so every once in a while as I'm running along the top of the desks, I'm gonna trip and fall and land on, what's your name? George, I'm gonna trip and fall and land on George, sorry. But, you know, so maybe his desk is wiggling a lot when I get there. I trip and fall, I impart energy to George, and then I've lost all my kinetic energy. What makes me go again is there has to be a net electric field in the material so that I can pick myself up as the electron, dust myself off, and start running again. So there must be a constant electric field at every place in the wire so that the electrons, when they bump into things, start moving again, okay? So we saw then that constant current in the wire means there's constant electric field in the wire. <clears throat> and we saw that, well, okay, it's a bit weird. We've talked a lot about how electric fields arise. We've talked about electric fields are generated by charges. There must be some net charge somewhere that exerts an electric field, okay? And this is a bit of an odd-shaped electric field, right? And not only is it odd-shaped, it can change shape as I move the wire, right? If I have a wire with a particular what this means is that there's an electric field pointing in a particular direction in the wire, if this were hooked up in a circuit, then as I change the shape of the wire, it just automatically responds. That's weird, right? So far, we've just talked about electric fields that come out of a point charge, and we know what the electric field shape is. So we saw that to create that kind of electric field, <clears throat> there must be charges on the surface of the wire. Now, what's happening is that all along the wire itself, there's charges accumulating on the surface. Now, in a conductor, 
We can't have net charges in the interior of the conductor, but we can have net charges happen on the surface. That's okay, all right? So for example, when I hook up this circuit here, I have two batteries here making a total of three volts. I have um, a light bulb, and when I hook it up, now there's current running through. That means there must be an electric field, all right? There must be an electric field all along the wire pointing in this direction. And we saw that what's the source microscopically, locally, if I look right here and imagine myself to be an electron inside the solid, the electric field that's right there driving my current direction is actually due to surface charges. And so we saw that <coughs> from the positive terminal of the battery, we can, we can think like there's, it's like there's positive charge that leaks out onto the surface of the copper. These are copper wires, okay? And so there's a little bit of positive charge here, a little bit less positive charge here, a little less positive charge here, and so on. And that that's what's locally driving that electric field because a difference between the net positive charge here and the net positive charge here causes a net electric field to point along the wire. Do you have any questions about last time? Yes? Why can there be excess charge inside the wire? Ah, okay. So in steady state in a conductor, we won't get net excess charge because what would happen if it's a, if I think of a conductor and I think of the interior of the conductor and let me just gather, you know, 100 electrons together and put them all in one spot in a conductor, they repel and so they'll fly away from each other. Okay, now they can only do that as far as the material goes. When they get to the edge of the material, bam, they're stuck there, right? They can spread out along the surface, but they can't go beyond the surface. So if I take any hunk of metal, even a wire, right, and let me just say I dump a bunch of electro extra electrons on it, those extra electrons won't be in the interior, they'll accumulate on the surface. They try to get as far apart from each other as they can, but the surface is as far apart as they can get from each other. Okay, so in a conductor, um, there's no net charge in the interior of the conductor in steady state. Does that answer your question? <coughs> Um, okay, so you're thinking about the very microscopic cases on really fast time scales, right? So you, you can, you can have a little, you know, teeny fluctuation on a very small scale and a very fast time, but it'll heal itself very quickly. Actually, we'll talk today, you're, actually, you're asking exactly the right questions. You could phrase your question of, well, how does this stuff happen microscopically? You could phrase it in terms of what in the world happens to make current suddenly start flowing, right? We'll see that. There's, uh, um, before you get to steady state, so steady state happens really quickly, right? I hook up this circuit, it goes from no current to constant, you know, to constant current instantly from our perspective. We'll calculate how long that took, okay? And I think that'll address your question of, well, what if I have a little bit of imbalance? How quickly does it go away, okay? All right, we'll discuss that today. Excellent question. All right, any other questions before we move on? Okay, so today, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the transient response when we connect a circuit. And that's going to address, well, what if I have a little bit of excess charge in the interior of a conductor? How quickly does it heal? It heals very quickly. We'll calculate that. And how, you know, how long until the steady state is reached? And we'll have a little bit of, of introduction to resistors. Um, Kirchhoff's voltage loop law we'll introduce as well. It turns out to be energy conservation. All right, so let's think about what happens when we connect a circuit up. We want to think about uh, what happens in this circuit. So again, I have, I have two, bat two D cell batteries here, 1.5 volts each, gives me three total volts. And then hooking this up here, once it's connected, there's a current, clearly, because the light bulb is, is lighting up. But I take it off, there's no current, right? Put it on, there's current. Take it off, there's no current. So we'd like to think about well, what is it that's going on microscopically on really fast time scales as we do this process. So what happens in a circuit just before and just after it's connected? Before it's connected, there's no current flowing. Okay. So uh, the definitions we have are that steady state is constant current. Equilibrium is constant zero current. Okay, so no, no net current flowing. So uh, initially, there's no current flowing. The system is in equilibrium. If we look back at our equation for current, so the equation we have for current is Q N A U times E. That's a lot of symbols. You'll remember that Q stands for charge, so it's the charge on the electron. 
little n is the number of carriers per unit volume. So it's the number of electrons per unit volume. <coughs> a is the cross-sectional area of the wire. So if I cut this wire in half, you'd see that there's insulation on the outside and there's a copper core. I mean the cross-sectional area of the copper core. Mu, or it's called U here in your book, is the mobility. The mobility is about, if I apply an electric field, how fast do the electrons respond? So here, if I apply an electric field, I multiply it by, by the mobility to tell me what's the average drift velocity of the electrons. So the mobility is a number that you look up for a particular material. So I know these wires are copper. I can look up on Wikipedia what's the mobility of electrons inside of copper, and then that's the number I would multiply <clears throat> by the applied field to find out what's the net drift velocity. So if something has a high mobility, the electrons move easier, right? High mobility, that would be a larger number here. If the electrons move easier, then when I apply a field, they'll move faster, okay? So that's what that has to do with. So in our situation here, now that I've reminded you what all that equation means, if there's no current flowing before I connect the circuit, well, what can be zero over here? Q can't be zero. The density of electrons doesn't change, right? That's just the density in copper. The cross-sectional area of the wire is not changing. The mobility. Mobility is just a number that has to do with copper. It's like copper is copper colored. Copper has this mobility. It's just a property of copper. So it's the electric field. That's zero right before I hook things up. So somehow we need to figure out how this thing goes from zero electric field in here to all of a sudden having an electric field that's driving a current. <clears throat> Do you have any questions about the question I'm asking? <laughs> okay, all right. So initially I have this battery in the circuit and the electric field inside the wires has to be zero. But here's an issue. I know that the battery has charges on it, okay? The battery has positive charges at the positive terminal and it has negative charges at the negative terminal, okay? So these batteries here, right, right here at the positive end here, I've got some positive charge. And that's putting out an electric field. So, and yet, right here in this wire, it's, it's total zero electric field. So there must be some surface charges already on the wire that protect it, basically, that mean that the net electric field inside the conductor is zero in equilibrium, okay? So there must be surface charges already pre-existing on the wire before we connect the, the circuit. Does that make sense that, I mean, basically what we've done is we've, we've argued from the big ideas that we know are right down to what must be happening at the small scale. We know that a conductor in equilibrium has zero electric field inside of itself, okay? So I know that when I have this being disconnected, there's zero electric field in the interior of the metal. And yet, I know there's positive charges here on the battery. Therefore, there just must be some positive charges on the wire itself, protecting the interior of the wire from that electric field, making it so that the net electric field inside the wire is zero. Do you have any questions about that line of reasoning? Okay, so that means there are some surface charges on the wire. Okay, so here's something about how that, how that might look. So here's the positive terminal, terminal of the battery. I haven't closed the gap yet, so I haven't turned the circuit on. And there must be some positive charges out here on the surface that keep the net electric field inside the interior of the wire zero. And in fact, there must be surface charges all the way out to the end, okay? Because it's got to maintain zero electric field inside the wire, right? If there's positive charges here, there must be positive charges here so that the net electric field in the wire is zero. All right, then that goes all the way out to the very end of the wire. The very end of the wire also has some positive charges on the very end. So if I think, for example, um, if I think, uh, so red, red is the positive side. So if I think about when I've got this circuit unhooked, the battery's not lit up, um, there's positive charges on the surface all the way out to the very tip. So on the very tip, there's positive charges. Right here, come, so off the negative side of the battery, there's a little bit of negative charge that leaks out onto the surface of the wire, which maintains zero electric field inside. And then there's a little bit of excess negative charge on the surface right there. So basically, imagine these charges getting closer and closer and closer and closer. When they touch, all right, as soon as they touch, there's no net uh, charge there anymore. Because I had some positive charge, I had some negative charge. They meet, they come together, and there's no net charge in that area anymore. So here's what I need to think about as I close the gap. I have these positive charges on one side, negative charges on the other. So this is just before the circuit's connected. Okay, 
and then I'm going to bring them together. When I bring them together, all right, I have these positive charges that now meet the negative charges, and in that region there'll be no net charge, right? Because these negative charges are electrons, they just flow over, bam, and everything's now neutral. So now there's no more charges here. Okay, in, we're thinking instantaneously, really fast, on the time scale of what's it like to be an electron inside of a solid. So now there's no net charge there, and yet there's all these surface charges, right? The surface charges are exerting an electric field in the interior of the material. So from the positive surface charges, I have net electric field coming away. From the negative uh, surface charges, I have net electric field going towards the negative charges. Right? So there's an electric field that looks like that right there. Same thing down here, those positive charges, electric field pointing away and coming back. All right? And then that, that field is what initially starts things moving. Bam! Now there has to be some current flow because of this net electric field. All right? I can work backwards and figure out what that field must be by doing the following. Let me go back to this situation. So let me think about keeping the two ends of the wire separate and I have positive charges here and negative charges here that are keeping everything from moving, right? Before I connect the circuit, there's no net electric field inside. Just due to the positive charges on the surface, I know what the electric field must look like. It comes away from those positive charges. Just due to the negative charges here on this end, I know there's an electric field coming in, right? But there's also all these other guys on the top and bottom there. That's this diagram here. So due to the positive charges on uh, the outer surface and the negative charges on the outer surface, there's also an electric field being exerted, and the net is zero, right? The net field before I connect the circuit has to be zero. So these are equal and opposite vectors, all right? The hollow vectors are the ones coming from the end faces. The solid vectors must be, right, we're inferring what that must be due to the surface charges on the, on the outer core of the, of the wire. All right, and now when I bring these charges together, one way to think about this is, okay, the hollow vectors disappear because there's no more charges there. They quit exerting, the, no more net charge is what we mean, right? The electrons move over a little bit. There's no net charge in that area, so there's no more um, electric field due to the gap faces. So these hollow vectors, boom, suddenly disappear, and what's left is the electric field from the surface charges. And now things start moving. So that's what happens instantaneously when we hook up this circuit, right? I'm bringing the positive charge close to the negative charge, and instantaneously when we hook it up, bam, now we get something going on. Do you have any questions so far? Okay. All right. What are you thinking so far? Does this make sense so far? Okay. You can always ask me a question to slow me down. Always legal. Okay. All right. All right. So everything, uh, the electric field um, looks like this before we close the circuit. We close the circuit. Now the electric field looks like this. Now we get things moving. All right. So what's moving right, right here where we just closed everything, um, we get a net electric field. Okay. <clears throat> now we are officially in what's called the transient, right? Before we connect the circuit, it's in steady state. It's even in equilibrium, right? Equilibrium is a special case of steady state. I don't know what the uh, extra noise is due to. Sorry. Got extra static going on. Um, so before we, go, before we close the circuit, it's in equilibrium, right? Equilibrium is a special case of steady state. Steady state means constant current. Equilibrium means zero current, right? So it's in equilibrium, no electric field. Now we connect it. Now there's an electric field right here where we just closed the gap. That's the instantaneous. And now we're in what's called the transient. Now something's going to happen all over the circuit at, that leads it to get into steady state. What we want to think about is, OK, instantaneously there's a field here. What is it that has to happen <clears throat> for things to start moving all over the entire circuit, right? So now I've got steady state. It must happen very quickly, right? We can't even see the difference here. So it must happen very quickly. So what we'd like to think about is how quickly does that disturbance propagate, OK? So how quickly is it that the fact that there's current moving here, how long does it take before there's current moving back here as well? So we need to think about, well, what are the velocities involved in the problem, OK? One of the velocities is the drift speed of electrons. 
The drift speed of electrons is 5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second, approximately. And there's another velocity in the problem. Okay? The other velocity is the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So I want you to think about this, and you solve the problem. Let's um, calculate how long would it take for an electron to move through. So let's think first in terms of electrons. These guys are flipping a switch, kind of a big switch. They're going to drive this light bulb over here. I've put them five meters apart. So when these guys flip the switch, your question is, how long does it take for electrons from the switch to travel those five meters and get to the light bulb? Okay, how long does that take? Now, be sure you do an actual calculation, because I, I have my graph up here of the answers. They're all over the map. So be sure you do, a, do, do get out your pencil and do an actual calculation with numbers. Okay. All right. Tell me what we have to think about here. We've got, we've got to have a good discussion because I'm telling you the answers are all over the map. So tell, tell me what your thoughts are. How long is this going to take? I flip the switch. How long does it take for those electrons to move five meters? Uh, you can also tell me what your neighbor thought. Who's brave? Anybody brave enough to tell me? How to get, yeah? Thanks. Okay, so he's arguing about a day. It's going to take a while. All right. And the way he got it is he said, okay, I'm just going to use distance equals rate times time. And I'll say that the distance is 5 meters. The rate is how fast electrons move, 5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second. And that led you to the answer of about a day. Okay, all right. What else should we think about? Because that's, that's a long time, don't you think? All right. All right, so she's arguing that we have to take into account observation, right? This is, this is great. This is how uh, science progresses, OK? All right, you did the calculation. You would be the theorist, right? There's, there's theory scientists who do math and do the calculation. I, I'm actually one of those. I, I'm a theorist. I do math, and I calculate the way the world is supposed to be. By golly, it's supposed to be this way, OK? That's you, the theorist. You're the experimentalist, OK? So she just said, look, I go into a room. I flip the switch, and bam, the lights come on. I do not have to flip the switch, walk away. You know, and then come back in a day later, oh, finally. So you're saying we have to match this up, right? How in the world do we reconcile the theory prediction of, you know, it's going to take a day with the real world observation, the experimental evidence that, by golly, these circuits turn on right away? OK, yes? OK, so you're pointing out, all right, maybe the way to re re resolve this paradox, and this is why we want you to calculate it. This is what we call a paradox. We have two seemingly conflicting ideas, okay, and we have to figure out how to resolve them. This is a classic paradox. So you're pointing out, look, electrons are all over the wire, so maybe I don't have to, maybe to get current moving in the circuit, maybe I don't have to move an electron all the way from the switch to the light bulb. Maybe I just think about all the electrons together, and when I flip the switch, maybe they just all start moving, okay? All right, other things we should take into account here? All right, you just saw exactly how science makes progress. Theory disagrees with experiment. We have to think and resolve the paradox, OK? So the resolution of the paradox is that there's electrons all over the thing. So let's, let's do this calculation. So what we want to think about is, again, I'm going to move electrons a distance of 5 meters. OK, so distance equals 5 meters. And their velocity is 5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second, all right? And so what the theorist said was, look, I should be able to take distance equals rate times time. I should be able to solve for time. OK, so it's going to be distance over the velocity. 5 meters divided by 5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second. All right, now I'm going to cancel some things. The 5s cancel, the meters cancel. That gives me 1 over 10 to the minus 5. That's a 5 right there. I have 1 over seconds in the denominator, so I must have seconds up top. And 1 over a really small number, right? 10 to the minus 5 is small. So what's 1 over a small number? Is it big or small? Big. So this, this is big. So I get 10 to the 5 seconds, which is 100,000 
seconds. That was the theoretical prediction, okay? All right, but we have to resolve it with our everyday experience. So he, this, this is it. This is how long it takes, okay? It takes a day. That's really weird, but you flip on that light switch in your room, and even though somehow current starts moving immediately, an electron from the switch will take about a day to get up there to your light bulb in the ceiling. All right, so it's like that. It's like when we flip on the switch, the electrons get on those little carts and they go, okay, and they move. And when we th leave this thing on, the electrons are actually moving. In, in one sense, they're moving very slowly, okay? So if I leave this on the entirety of class, the electrons will move about this far during a whole discussion, okay? That's weird. That's, that's, that's very strange. All right, so we need to figure out then, well, <laughs> what, what else is going on? What's, what's going on in here is, like you pointed out, there's electrons all over the place, and we hook things up, and the whole bunch of them starts moving and starts moving, okay? All right, so we've got one more calculation to do to figure out the other velocity in the problem. So let's do that, and then we'll come back to this and figure out how in the world electrons that move so slowly can carry so much well, it can have such a big effect. Um, okay, so the right answer here is D, about a day, right? So how long does it take for electrons from the switch to get to the light bulb? It takes about a day, all right? All right, here's your next calculation to do, all right? Let's think in terms of information and electric fields. An electric field can propagate at the speed of light. When I make a change in the electric field here, it bam! That, that disturbance can propagate at the speed of light. So how long until information about the change in electric field, so these guys flip the switch, they change the electric field here, how long until the light bulb knows about that change in electric field? That's the question. All right, tell me what you're thinking. How long does it take for the information about the change in electric field to reach the light bulb? About how long does that take? <coughs> Yeah? Yes. All right. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Using physical intuition is always encouraged. Like, this is the fastest one up there is. By golly, it's, it's really fast. Awesome. OK. How, how would we calculate it? Yeah? OK. So let me, let me repeat for the people in the back. So this is great, because this, this is also part of how science progresses. We have the observation and physical intuition back here of, by golly, it's fast. All right? And then we have the calculation, the theory part of this, which thankfully in this case is matching, uh, which is that the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And we're going to do the same thing again. Distance equals rate times time. How long does it take for the change in electric field to propagate to the other side? So basically what you're arguing, what you're both arguing, is that the thing that happens is that actually it's probably clearer if I switch it back here. So I've unhooked the circuit, and here is where I make the change. And this guy knows about it really, really fast, about nanoseconds, because it's not that electrons have gotten there already, it's that at the speed of light, a signal, an electric field signal, propagates down the wire. So let's see what the time scales are of that. Distance equals rate times time. In this case, it's C times T. So I'll solve for the time, distance over C, 5 meters over 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. I'm going to cancel some stuff. I can't cancel 5 divided by 3, but I can cancel the meters. You guys can see that, right? All right. <clears throat> 5 divided by 3 is about 1.6. So 1.6 over 10 to the 8. The seconds is going to come up. 10 to the 8th is big, right? So 1 over a big number is, what? how did you <laughs> say it was going to be? Really fast. Right, exactly. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> we've got this here. So 1.6 times 10 to the minus 8 seconds, okay, which is now if I rearrange some factors of 10, I'll get 16 times 10 to the minus 9 seconds, which is 16 nanoseconds. 
or really fast. OK, so in about 16 nanoseconds, that's how fast the light bulb knows. We turn it on, 16 nanoseconds later, this guy finds out about it, and it immediately starts going. Do you have any? I don't know what that uh, extra noise is from. Sorry. Um, do you have any questions about that? OK. All right. So we need to, to reconcile our physical intuition with what's going on inside, inside the circuit. I mean, the, the weird thing is, is OK, the disturbance in electric field propagates really fast, right? 16 nanoseconds, as you told us how to calculate. So that's fast. And yet, somehow, in some sense, the electrons are moving really slowly, right? If I go back to thinking about, all right, I'm an electron inside of the material, right? Let's think about this. <clears throat> From our perspective, it looks like the electron is moving really slowly. From the electron's perspective, though, imagine yourself an electron inside of a, of a solid. You look out on a sea of atoms. Your desks are the atoms. I'm the electron that's going to run around at a particular rate. Let's think about uh, one second, OK? So the electron moves at 5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second. How many atoms, let me just pick any direction in the solid, how many atoms am I going to pass per second if I'm the electron? Roughly. How would we, how would we calculate that? Let's, <clears throat> let's think about that. So I'll, move, I'll leave this guy up, and I want to ask, OK, how, you know, how am I going to think about how many atoms do I pass per second? How many atoms does one electron pass in one second? Okay, and its drift speed again is ten times, oh, sorry, five times ten to the minus five meters per second. All right, and think inside of a solid. What's a rough number for the distance between atoms in a solid? What is it? Okay. I have to think in terms of, when I think of atoms, I'm always going to think angstroms. OK, atomic scales are angstroms. And an angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. The symbol for that is A with a little circle on top, OK? So 10 to the minus 10 meters is about the size of an atom. That's also about the distance between atoms in a solid. It can be about one <laughs> angstrom or five angstroms, something like that. But we'll think about one angstrom for now. So, you know, how many atoms does one electron pass in one second? The thing that I would have to compare is um, I need to compare the, uh, the, the 5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second with the one angstrom distance. So that's 10 to the minus 10 meters, right? So I'm going to get then that, canceling these guys, I'm going to get about 10 to the minus 5 plus 10, right? In a second. And then, do you see what I did? I put the 10 up in the numerator. So now I get a plus 5 up here. And this is per second, OK? So that's about 500,000 atoms per second. So if I go back to thinking about being the electron inside of the solid, and I'm running along those desks, right? So this is how many atoms per second the electron has to pass. All right? So I'm thinking of myself as the electron inside the solid. Can you imagine running that fast? 500,000 desks per second. OK? So from our perspective, from the outside, it looks like this electron has a slow velocity, right? And the amount of time we've been talking while that circuit's on, the electron has gone about this far. From our perspective, that is insanely slow. From the electron's perspective, it's sweating bullets. It's passing 500,000 atoms per second, for goodness sake. So it's, you know, as fast as it can, sweating bullets. Oh, my goodness. So from inside the solid, this actually looks like a very, very fast speed. Now, the other thing we need to consider is, OK, fine, the electron's working hard. But how many electrons are actually in this material? So a good estimate, <clears throat> basically for any hunk of matter you can hold in your hand, OK? Here's a hunk of matter I can hold in my hand. So if it's about this size, I can think of it as about an Avogadro's number, right? About one mole is something I can hold in my hand, OK? Maybe 10 moles, but about that range. How many atoms are in a mole? Where, where are my chemists? <laughs> 
Yeah, so 6 times 10 to the 23, the important thing there being the 10 to the 23. In any hunk of matter I can hold in my hand, there are about 10 to the 23 atoms. Okay? In a metal, there's about one electron per atom contributed into the electron seat. So that means in this hunk of wire, there's about 10 to the 23 electrons. 10 to the 23, right? There's about, what, 8 billion people in the world? So if each person got 10 to the 4, to get, you know, a 10 trillion or 100 trillion, if each person had 100 trillion electrons to contribute, then we'd have about 10 to the 23 electrons. So it's basically the reason that these electrons are having such a big effect macroscopically, even though from our perspective they're moving slowly, is because there's 10 to the 23 of them in the wire. So in fact, they can be moving just this small distance, but there's 10 to the 23 of them moving. And so that give, that's what gives you the fact that this is actually a very large current. Okay? Many, 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 many electrons contribute to it. Do you have any questions about that? That's basically what life is like for an electron inside of a metal. Okay, so because there are so many, there's so many is the 10 to the 23, because there are so many electrons in the wire, they don't have to move far to create a large current. They just kind of lean a little bit and they've made a large current, right? When 10 to the 23 electrons lean sideways, that's a big current. So here's what we've just figured out. This is how the transient response goes in this circuit just as I'm making the connection. What happens is that right at the connection point, there's an electric field. That electric field change now gets distributed around the entire circuit at roughly the speed of light. So within a few nanoseconds, steady state is established, which is, as you were saying in the back, really fast. It gets established. All right, so now I want to think in terms of what happens if I now have a junction between two different wires. Let me make the wires the same material. So this, let's say this is copper and this is copper. But I'm going to have one wire be thick and the other wire be skinny. Okay, so I'm going to have a thick wire feeding into a skinny wire. And I want to have a steady state situation where the current here is equal to the current here. And think about what happens to the velocity of the electrons as they're going along this big thick wire and suddenly encounter a skinny wire. What, what happens to you in your car, by the way, when this happens to you with your car? Your car is driving along the freeway and you've got a nice big wide road and all of a sudden the road gets skinnier. What happens to your car? Do you speed up when you see that or do you have to slow down? Yeah, you get a traffic jam, right? Okay, so this is actually going to be opposite to what happens to electrons inside of a material. For electrons inside a material, I don't want to think about cars on a freeway. I want to think about water flowing through pipes, all right? So let's think about this in terms of water flowing through pipes. If water is flowing through a pipe here and it's coming through the thick pipe and then gets to a skinny pipe, how can we figure out the answer here? Who has, in their childhood, or maybe recently, had a water fight with someone with a water hose. Anybody ever had a water fight with a water hose? I know you did, back in kindergarten. Yes, okay. So, if you have your water hose, and water is coming out of the water hose, what can I do to make that water come out faster and soak my friend? What do I do? Put your thumb over it. Yeah, yeah, you guys all know this. All right, yeah, you put your thumb over it, right? Okay, so this is what you do, right? That's how you soak your friend. So, if I have water, flowing out of the hose at a certain rate, and I want to make the water come out faster, I have to reduce the cross-sectional area. The reason you knew this in kindergarten was because you had this equation in your head, right? You said, look, I have a certain rate of flow of the water coming out. I know how to solve this problem. I just need to reduce the cross-sectional area of the hose. And then that'll speed up the water coming out. The water will go further, and it'll soak my friend. I, I, you know so much physics that you didn't realize you knew as a kindergartner, okay? So kindergarten physics told you it goes faster when you constrict it. That's exactly what's happening inside the wire. When we have the wire and the electrons going through, if you constrict them, they have to go faster to get through with the same flow rate. All right, that's it for today, and I'll see you guys on Monday.